Yo, what's good, fellow fantasy lovers? Welcome back to the Movie Blog, where we dive into the latest and the greatest in film and TV. Today, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the Rings of Power Episode 4, right? The episode that has more twists and turns than a wizard's staff. Trust me, if you're not watching the Rings of Power, you're missing out. So, Episode 4 kicks off with Elrond and Galadriel doing what they do best, worrying. This time they have trust issues within their own ranks and our elf duo is having an issue with reaching Celebrimbor, who's gone radio silent. You know it's bad when elves start ghosting each other, but what really caught my eye here were these stunning aerial shots that scream fellowship and a ring nostalgia. We got snowy mountains, we got epic landscapes, it's like we're back in the good old days but with some much needed diversity. I love how this series feels like a well-fitting companion to the Peter Jackson series and has it, at least noticeably, contradicted with the things in those films. I adore those movies and I'm really enjoying The Rings of Power and how it makes me better appreciate uh, specifically the Fellowship of the Ring. And you know, speaking of diversity, shout out to the casting team for keeping it real with more black and Asian elves in Galadriel and Elrond's company. You know, I'm bothered by the fact that out of all the elves to get got this episode that it had to be the black elf. Like, damn rings of power. Can you at least give me this dude's name first? You know, that was kind of bothersome. Anyway, uh, duh. Galadriel's vision sequence with the ring of power was another highlight. You know, our girl can sense evil like your grandma senses when you're about to eat before dinner. I wondered how similar the Rings of Power were to the One Ring, and it feels like they're pretty similar after all. Maybe just to like a lesser extent or like less strength. Elrond, on the other hand, is not here for the whole Ring of Power advice thing, right? He's got that whole I don't give a F vibe when it comes to using tools built by Sauron's design. It's fascinating to see these characters evolve, especially when, you know, disappointment is the catalyst. And let's be real. When an elf says, I'm not with the shits, you know that things are about to get serious. All right, let's switch gears to The Stranger, our mystery man in black, and he somehow lost his hobbits. But don't worry, he stumbles upon Tom Bombadil, who's living his best life in a garden oasis right in the middle of the desert. Now, Tom is one of those characters who's like, I'm just here to vibe, right? He's whimsical, he's mysterious, and he has a thing for talking to trees, one of which nearly takes The Stranger out. Tom drops some major lore bombs too, talking about how he's been around since the creation of the world. And can we talk about the stranger's reaction? He's like, bro, what even are you? And Tom just brushes it off like, I'm old, you're young, it is what it is. That, that's some peak wizard energy right there. Meanwhile, our Harford friends, who apparently have nine lives, survive getting tossed into the sky by a tornado, only to land near some desert-dwelling halflings. These folks are like the Harfoot's rugged cousins, but with bigger ears or something. And oh snap, there's a romance brewing between Poppy and Merrimack. All right now. Let's just say Merrimack might need to take a math class or two. My guy can't count for anything. One thing I'm loving about The Rings of Power is how it's making a case for itself as a modern classic. The OG Lord of the Rings was great, but this show? It's bringing that diversity heat, and I'm here for it. We even meet some halflings who don't trust wizards and start talking about the Dark Wizard. Oh, and I'm loving the Dark Wizard too. There's so much that is going on with him and his whole army of goons that I find incredibly appealing. And I love how Tom Bombadil foreshadows the fight between the Stranger and the Dark Wizard. Back to our elf crew. They find themselves in a dark forest that Galadriel had seen in her visions. It's given off some realize why. There's ghosts in these woods, and not the friendly kind either. Their swords are about as useful as a screen door in a submarine, but that just adds to the tension. And just when you think things can't get worse, they find the bodies of the messengers they sent to check on Kellen Brimbor. It's moments like these that remind you, Middle Earth is not for the faint-hearted, but hey, at least they're exploring some new mystical creatures, right? Now, let's talk about our boy Isildur. He's got his own set of problems, including trying to rescue Theo. Isildur is getting some love interest vibes from Astrid, but let's be honest, he's a bit clueless. And Astrid? She's got some explaining to do because our Afro-Latino elf is onto her. Turns out that at some point she swore allegiance to Adar. 
I gotta give props to the show for not dragging out the betrayal reveal. They catch on quick and Astrid ends up handcuffed, but hey, don't worry, our favorite elf, Arandir, has a heart and leaves the key for Isildur to decide what to do next. It's these little moments of character development that's keeping me hooked. Anyway, so episode 4 of Rings of Power, it's a wild ride from start to finish. We get some deep lore, we get some epic battles, and we get enough twists to keep even the most seasoned Middle Earth bands on their toes. If this is what we're getting mid-season, I can't wait to see how they wrap things up. Anyway, that's all I have for this one. Thanks for hanging out with me today on the Movie Blog. Hey, good morning. I am Anthony with the Movie Blog. I am so excited to speak with you both. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I know you both are very busy. <laughs> uh, excuse me, a little nervous. Um, but I know you both are very busy. I'm going to try to be brief and really, really try to have fun, but really get to the meat of it. Um, so oh, Rings of Power season two. Season one sparked a lot of conversations online, right? There were moments with Queen Muriel and Gil Galads. Uh, that have fans speculating on Gilgalad's true intentions and how the Queen is going to navigate this political drama. Can you give any hints about your characters' uh, arcs or Gilgalad's and Queen Muriel's expanded roles to help get fans excited for season two? And and if you can start first, Cynthia, that would be great. Oh, sorry, no, sorry. Are you no, sure? No, no, no it's. I feel like it's on the. No, no. Part of being a good leader is knowing when to shush. <laughs> Well, hints and teases. I mean, I, uh, specifically for Mediel, and, and first of all, just to sort of acknowledge the fact that there is a lot of conversation online, and I love that, you know, we get to sort of present stories that people know, that some people know, and yet there is still that sort of continuation of, like, trying to decide, okay, well, we think that this is now going to happen, this twist is going to happen, even though some of these characters and storylines are familiar to people, there's still room to kind of expand on that, which I think is very cool. Uh, for Miriel specifically, you know, where we leave her at the end of season one, she suffered tremendous loss, you know, in every sort of facet of her life. And so now we're going to have to see, well, how is she going to sort of rise up from that? How is she going to navigate her blindness? How is she going to navigate this transition of power now that the king has passed? Um, how is she going to answer to her Numenorean people? Those are sort of like the, the questions that we're sort of asking at the beginning of season two. And what I will say is, in my estimation, who Midiel is at the beginning of season two is not the woman you will see by the end of the season. So I think that that is something that I'm really excited for the fans to to see and and sort of take that statement uh and interpret it as you will ben and benjamin if you could chime in yeah the same thing I mean, if you know if you know the lore you have an idea of where the king's going but if you don't uh in the first season you get to see him be a uh a peacekeeper and in the second season you get to see how he reacts when uh peace breaks down the well, your, <laughs> your characters had some really intense moments in season one, especially with the visions, the political turmoil in Numenor. How did you process the fan reactions to your portrayals of such a such complex characters? And and more importantly, what did you learn from that experience? I think it's a it's a delicate balance, and everybody is different in this regard. For me personally, I can't absorb too much of the the conversation sometimes it's noise sometimes it's interesting but i don't know if it serves me to then move forward to continue telling this tale you know i think it's interesting as like a as a side conversation but i don't know that i can uh, take it on and absorb it and really it's it's the showrunners who are sort of navigating this ship in terms of story and 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 how the story is laid out so it's a tough one because while I appreciate the conversation, I think if I kind of take on too much of it, I, I don't know if I can utilize it for, for me. But that's just me personally. Everybody everybody is different, I would say. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But also, the I like that there is a conversation. Yeah. The, the death of any art is indifference. I don't want anyone to come watch the show and then go, okay, where are we ordering pizza? 
I want them to have a conversation, even if it's a frustrated one, where they have differing opinions and are excited about the trajectory, whether they agree with it or not, that, that we have our foot in the door of the conversation of Tolkien is an honor. Um, and to be part of that conversation is an honor and a privilege. Because we're all fans of Tolkien, and we all have opinions about it. And uh, again, that if people watch it and, you know, what are we watching next? Well, th then we haven't fully served Tolkien. The, I think it's the best sign the people that are passionate about Tolkien are passionate about our show, even if it means there's some dissension in the ranks. It's only positive. And also, with the second season, I think I can say with confidence, uh, if you were in any way frustrated by the first season, you're going to get your hair blown back with the second season. <laughs> <laughs> well... Thank you both so much. I'm very excited for season two. I know my fans are too, and I can't wait to see what you both have in your future. Thank you so much. Anthony with the movie blog. Thanks, Thank Anthony. You.